Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Laszlo Krasna Horkai's novella, The Last Wolf, translated from the Hungarian by George Sertz in this nice little uh, New Directions publication. If you've never read Krasna Horkai, this is a perfect place to start, as you get a really good sense of his writing style and the ideas and themes that he's really interested in. And for the sake of this video, I'm going to leave Herman aside and just focus on the novella The Last Wolf. Krasna Horkai's unique writing style really helps him drive home the themes and ideas that he wants to explore. That is, he has mastered his craft, and the fusion of the ideas that he's interested in with this relentless force of his prose style really go hand in hand. He writes in these long, convoluted sentences. The Last Wolf, in fact, is just a single sentence. But it doesn't come across as gimmicky in any way. Instead, it's fundamental to the way in which he's exploring these themes. I think this style of writing is so powerful. And just to shout out two other writers who do this extremely well that, again, doesn't come across as gimmicky is Thomas Bernhard, obviously, um, and Matthias Ennaz Zone, which is one of my favorite books of all time. The Last Wolf is about this depressed and aging academic who is sort of past his prime, especially academically. He used to be a big shot, but now very few people care about him or his work. And this guy, our narrator, is telling this story to a bored Hungarian bartender at a desolate rundown bar in Berlin. And the story that he tells is how he, this narrator, was seemingly randomly uh, invited to go to Extremadura, which is a sort of barren desert, to recount the story of the last wolf in Spain who was allegedly just killed. So right from the start, we can see how Krasna Horkai adds in all of these layers to his narrative. What we're reading is this guy telling a story to another guy, but within that story there is all of these first-hand accounts about the wolves in, in Extremadura. And of course, there's pretty clear parallels here between the story about the hunters who killed this last wolf in Spain and our narrator's hunt for this story. This hunt narrative is actually really uh, interesting to me as it reminds me a lot of a lot of medieval literature which uses this hunting motif um, to get at a, lar a lot of larger themes that those stories are interested in. If you've ever read um, the Middle English Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, you probably know what I'm talking about. And of course, this isn't just a medieval trope. Um, I spoke recently in a video about Shone and the Blue Fox, and this book is really set up as a sort of hunter chasing a prey through the Icelandic uh, high highlands. But I'll come back to this idea of, of hunting um, a bit later in the video. Like in a lot of Krasna Horkai's works, the narrator is a bit of an obsessive, and he tells the story in such intense detail that it really sucks you in. But what's really interesting here is how this frame narrative works. Our narrator is recounting uh, the, these stories to this bartender who is incredibly bored. So we get this juxtaposition between our narrator's obsessive chase of these stories about the last wolf and the barman's uninterested reaction to it. At one point, the, the barman even falls asleep. And all of this is juxtaposed with our reading of the story. If you can put down this single sentence novella, uh, before the sentence ends, well, you have more self-control than me. I get sucked into it and can't really uh, get out of the trap. That's kind of why I'm scared of reading some of Krasna uh, uh much longer works. But let me just read the first page or so to give you a sense of his writing style, but it will also expose uh, Krasna Horkai's wry humor that is apparent throughout this entire story. This text begins, There he was, laughing but in trying to laugh in a more abandoned manner, he'd become preoccupied with the question of whether there was any difference at all between the burden of futility on the one hand and the burden of scorn on the other, as well as with what he was laughing about anyways. Because the subject was, uniquely, everything, arising from an everything that was everywhere. And, what was more, if indeed it was everything, arising out of everywhere, it would be difficult enough to decide what it was at, arising out of what, and in any case, it wouldn't be full-hearted laughter, because futility and scorn were what continually oppressed him. And he was doing nothing, not a damn thing, simply drifting, spending hours sitting in the sharp vein with his first glass of Sternberg at his side, while everything around him positively dripped with futility, not to mention scorn. There is this ridiculousness to this whole story, as our narrator really can't figure out 
um, if he's being burdened with futility or scorn, why was he invited to go chronicle the story of this last wolf? He's just a miserable and kind of declining academic. Why him? Was he invited by mistake? In many ways, this question is really what drives this narrator as he tries to get to the bottom of the mystery of the last wolf, but also this mystery of why is he the one who has to tell this story? It's sort of existential in that way, uh, reminiscent of the neurotic and confused narrators of Camus and Kafka. To get to this narrator's obsessive yet frustrated and failing mental state and his fight against these ideas, let me just read another excerpt. For how could he describe what so weighed him down? How could he explain how long ago he had given up the idea of thought, the point at which he first understood the way things were and knew that any sense we had of existence was merely a reminder of the incomprehensible futility of existence, a futility that would repeat itself ad infinitum to the end of time and that, no, it wasn't a matter of chance and its extraordinary, inexhaustible, triumphant, unconquerable power working to bring matters to birth or annihilation, but rather the matter of a shadowy demonic purpose, something embedded deep in the heart of things, in the texture of the relationship between things, the stench of whose purpose filled every atom. That was a curse, a, for a form of damnation, that the world was the product of scorn. And God help the sanctity of those who called themselves thinkers, which was why he, he no longer thought, had learned not to think anymore. And it goes on. It's really difficult to figure out when to stop a reading in Krasna Horkai's writing as the sentences and ideas just sort of melt into each other. So our narrator goes to Extremadura and with the help of a translator speaks with some of the locals as well as a game warden um, who is in charge of the area in which the last wolf was known to inhabit. And a side note, I just love stories that involve translators as again, it just adds a layer of communication and interpretation and the potential for miscommunication and misinterpretation that I just, I just love digging my teeth, my teeth into that kind of stuff. But anyways, Extremadura is this desert kind of wasteland in Western Spain on the border of Portugal. Um, and the name Extremadura is really important for our narrator and for the story as well. And he explains, because he knew that the whole place, Extremadura, was outside the world, because extra means outside, out of, you get it? And that was what was so wonderful about both the land and the people, that nobody was really aware of the danger presented by the proximity of the world, that they, the Extremadurians, lived in terrible danger, because, he explained to the barman, they had no idea what they were letting themselves in for what spiritual changes would be set in motion once the autopistas and shopping centers had laid havoc to their fields, fields where the poverty had been terrible. And on top of this, we get these very long and beautiful descriptions of the landscape that I won't read out loud right now, but the, importance, the, the important part about the landscape is how barren and desolate it is. It's really not unlike the sort of uh, remote and rundown Hungarian towns that a lot of his novels take place in. But this geography of Extremadura really helps Krasna Horkai emphasize one of the main themes of this novella, which is the relationship between the natural world and the civilized world, as well as the relationship, uh, often the antagonistic relationship between humans and animals within that dichotomy of of nature on one side and civilization on the other side. At one point, a character even asks, why does anyone even care that the last wolf in Spain um, was killed? Aren't wolves and humans enemies? Haven't they been enemies for the past few thousand years? Shouldn't humans want to exterminate all of these wolves, all of these predators? Isn't this just a natural phenomenon? And this sort of objectivist philosophy really comes under fire as our narrator becomes more and more sympathetic to the plight of the, of the wolves. And in fact, they learn that this wolf that, that, was, that was killed, um, that our narrator visits, this wolf is kind of stuffed and inside of a glass display case, but they learn that this wolf wasn't actually the last wolf and that there's at least two more wolves left in this area. Here, the story pivots to our narrator sort of trying to save the wolves, or at least figure out if they're still alive, he becomes more and more sympathetic 
to the wolves as the story goes on. A large part of the shift occurs when our narrator meets um, Jose Miguel, who is the game warden uh, in charge of this area where the wolves are. And our narrator is talking to Jose Miguel, again, through this translator. And we get these passages of this confusion of communication. But it was a long time before he spoke again. And even then, it was only to answer a question, not one he had put, but one asked by the interpreter, who asked it in Spanish without translation, so he couldn't tell what they were talking about. Noticing only that the interpreter was vigorously nodding in agreement, but still not translating as Jose Miguel spoke even faster, until, once I started giving her impatient looks, he said she eventually explained that he was simply talking about wolves, how, how there was something marvelous about the characters of wolves, and the way she said this surprised me, he said, because her voice sounded quite different from, from before. It was distinctly trembling. And he wanted to ask her what had happened, what the warden had said that had so moved her, but did not ask, just looked at her, and then at Jose Miguel. And eventually she yelled out to the, at the top of her voice that what Jose Miguel had been saying was that he was never disappointed in them and never would be. And finally, she goes on to actually translate what Jose Miguel said that moved her so much. And it's this simple quote that she translates from the Spanish. The love of animals is the one true love in which one is never disappointed. Throughout this story, there's this really eco-critical commentary on the nature of the relationship between humans and animals. And the wolf really comes to embody this ambiguous figure that is a predator to humans in many ways, mainly because how it attacks uh, humans' livestock. Um, but at the same time, wolves are these kind of almost domestic figures. They're so similar to dogs that we have a difficult time kind of telling them apart often, or not necessarily telling the difference between them, but understanding the real difference between them. Um, I don't, this idea is explored quite a bit in, um, in Cormac McCarthy's The Crossing, the second book of the Border Trilogy. And in both of these stories, these wolves exist within this liminal space between human civilization and, well, I guess, unadulterated nature. And I guess in both of these stories, wolves are the sort of ultimate barrier standing in the way of humans' complete conquest of nature. The real question is, is do they, the wolves, carry this burden of futility or this burden of scorn that the first sentence of this novella brings up? Or do we carry those things? And I mentioned Albert Camus earlier, so let me actually just quote from his The Myth of Sisyphus. Um, he explains here, again, he's talking about he's talking about Sisyphus, and he says, The gods had condemned Sisyphus to ceaselessly rolling a rock to the top of a mountain, whence a stone would fall back on its own weight. They had thought with some reason that there is no that there is no more dreadful punishment than futile and hopeless labor. And a little, little bit later on, it goes on to explain that. The lucidity that was to constitute his torture at the same town crowns his victory. There is no fate that cannot be surmounted by scorn. I thought that might just be an interesting connection to make that is very existentialist uh, in its philosophy, but the dichotomy and the tension between futility on one side and scorn on the other, that again, the first sentence of The Last Wolf um, brings to our attention. We never really get a proper ending to this story about the last wolf in Extremadura, but we do get an ending to our narrator. And skip ahead until this text is off the screen um, if you don't want to be spoiled, as this happens right at the very end of, of the novella. But we, we do get this, this some bit of, of finality uh, at, at the end. And yes, he replied, turning to face the window, but did not continue, saying nothing more, for how could he explain that though he had returned to the place he had left, in order to make a brief visit to Extremadura, what remained for him was a life without thought. In other words, the deathly wasteland of the Sparsfain, this cold, empty, hollow square. And the fact that he, he had not earned this or that amount of euros for doing as asked, but had instead locked Extremadura in the depths of his own cold, empty, hollow heart. And that ever since then, day after day, he had been rewriting the end of Jose Miguel's story in his head, and that that's exactly where he was now, at the end. Krasnohorkai's narrative and his long, sprawling sentences create a sort of Ouroboros, like a hunter chasing its prey. This narrative chases itself as our narrator writes and rewrites it, creating a loop ad infinitum. 
in a way, the story ends where it began, in the, in the mind of a cold, empty, hollow heart of a depressed academic in a cold, empty, and hollow square of a bar in Berlin. Krasnohorkai demands a lot of his readers, but his prose style is so enjoyable that the density of his ideas just sort of wash over you so that when you finish it, all you want to do is read it all again. And I think that's really the magic of his prose. Let me know what you think about Krasnohorkai or The Last Wolf. I'm really anticipating his new novel, Chasing Homer, which is being published in English this fall. Um, and I'm actually really tempted to go back and read through all of his novels um, before then, but we'll see. Anyways, for now, thanks for watching.